on episode 485 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Michael Easter and discuss his book, The Comfort Crisis. Embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 485. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. This episode of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is sponsored by Naked Nutrition. What does getting naked mean? For supplements, it means no unnecessary additives. It means premium sourced ingredients without fillers, so you don't need to compromise on your diet or your goals. That's what Naked Nutrition offers. Back in 2014, a former college athlete didn't understand why protein powders and other supplements had so many unnatural ingredients. If they're supposed to be health supplements, why can't you understand the ingredient list? Naked Nutrition was started with five single ingredient supplements, including the best selling Naked Whey, which has only one ingredient whey protein from grass fed California cows, and the best selling Naked Pea, a vegan protein made from one ingredient raw yellow peas grown in the US and Canada. The company has grown to offer over 40 products, but the vision of sourcing the best ingredients using as few of them as possible, and being transparent so you know exactly what's going into your body is the same today as when the company was founded. Whether you're working towards losing weight, having more energy, or improving your endurance to become a better runner, what you put in your body directly impacts how you feel and the results you get. Naked Nutrition is committed to shortening the steps between their farms and you. Get naked. Visit Naked Nutrition today. It's nutrition with nothing to hide. Use the discount code 40 plus and get 10% off your first order. NakedNutrition.com. Let me ask you a question. If you were in the same place one year from now, same weight, same health markers, same fitness, how would you feel? Okay, now a follow on question. What are you doing to make next year better? Listening to Health and Fitness Podcast isn't going to do anything. You must take action if you want to change. In the 40 Plus Fitness 12-Week Gas Program, we're doing just that. I provide the gas, guidance, accountability, and support. And you take the wheel and go. I'm so sure you'll get results on this program that I offer a full 100% money-back guarantee. Action, results. If you're tired of being stuck in the mud, do your future self a favor and go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash gas. Complete the short application and we'll figure out what you need to do to make sure you're not the same next year. 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash gas. Hey, Raz. How are things going? Good. How are you today, Alan? I'm doing okay. It's um, it's been a really weird week here. We... uh, (laughs) Uh, I was supposed to uh, interview uh, uh, Dr. Bubbs again. I've had him on the show before. He has a really interesting book out. So I was supposed to interview him. And then, you know, our our, our power company announces, they're going to turn the power off on Wednesday, the whole day. Oh, no. So I was like, okay. So I have to cancel with him. I'd cancel a couple of different appointments because I'm like, well, if I don't have power, I don't have internet. If I don't have internet, I don't have anything. So I canceled all this stuff. And then we had this really bad rainstorm. And the rainstorm the night, the day before knocked out my, my phone. So I was trying to have a call with the client and then I lost phone signal in a place oh, that I gosh. always have phone signal. It's pouring down rain. I'm standing out in the rain. I'm walking around trying to find <laughs> signal, you know, can you hear me now? Um, the whole thing. And then, so then, yeah, the next day I'm thinking they're going to turn off all the power, but because it was raining, they didn't turn off the power. <laughs> and then oh, there was a strike on the mainland by the banana workers, the, you know, the workers that work on the banana farms, oh. uh, because they don't like how management's doing things. They decided to cut off the ferry to the island and therefore they couldn't bring diesel to the island for the power plant. And therefore, they were going to have to cut power again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this that's time, so crazy. This time, it was like, we were going to have to cut it. 
And they said, we're going to cut it at six o'clock. And then, you know, of course the merchants on the island are like six o'clock on a Saturday night, you're going to oh. cut power to the whole island. And they're like, yeah, we got to do that. And I'm like, no, no, can't you wait till six o'clock and in the morning and then cut it then? You know, yeah, you'll be lower in fuel, but then you cut it and we cut it till we get fuel. And they're like, so they agreed to do that. And then it turned out about midnight, they negotiated a deal and they let the ferry come over. So they never had to cut the power, but it was just kind of one of those wow. you know, power, the power is going to go out because they're going to do some maintenance. Then the power is going to go out because there's a strike. And then it's just been a very interesting third world living on an island. <laughs> <laughs> that is experience. quite an adventure. My goodness. How crazy. So slightly uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> so how have you been up up there in Michigan? Oh, good, good. It's been beautiful up here. We actually did a whole lot of yard work over the weekend, expanding some garden space and um, put down some new mulch and making it nice for um, the time we spend outdoors. So it's it's been really nice. Heated heated running trail. Um, Not yet, but it's on my list. (laughs) It's on my list. Don't forget, winter's going to come back around. Don't (laughs) forget, you know, now now that the ground's thawed. Actually, we're supposed to get snow tomorrow, actually. Oh, okay. But (laughs) that's nothing. That's nothing. Just a normal... Normal yeah. little snow shower in April, late April. That's right. Spring, <laughs> spring snow showers. Hopefully it won't be that bad. <laughs> yeah. But I saw a picture uh, on your Facebook. Uh, you and Mike got to spend some time with family that you haven't had the opportunity to spend some time with. That's right. Yeah. Mike and I are both fully vaccinated and passed the two week um, timeline post back the second vaccination for him. And my parents have been vaccinated for some time now. So we were able to meet them and have lunch. And I even got a hug. And it's important because I haven't hugged my parents since um, over a year ago before the lockdown. So, you know, I've been nervous to give them COVID or to make them sick in some way. So we've been very careful this whole time. And, and now that we're vaccinated, it's just a little bit, um, it's a little bit more comfortable you know, getting in closer proximity again. So it was really wonderful to be able to hug my parents again. That's really cool. That's Mm -hmm. really cool. So let's go ahead and talk to Michael Easter. Yes. Our guest today is a contributing editor at Men's Health Magazine, columnist for Outside Magazine, and professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His work has appeared in more than 60 countries and can be found in Men's Journal, New York, Vice, Scientific American, Esquire, and others. With no further ado, here's Michael Easter. Michael, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, thank you so much for having me. You know, your book is called The Comfort Crisis, Embrace Discomfort to Reclaim Your Wild, Happy, Healthy Self. And um, the stories that you you tell in this book um, could have left you, well, obviously wild, uh, probably unhealthy and unhappy uh, had had things happened in a different way. Fortunately, yes, it's a happy ending, and Michael's still here to tell us the stories, but you've had some pretty interesting adventures. I have, yes, and I luckily, yeah, I am here to, to talk about them. So in reporting the book, the main arc of the book is this 33 days that I spent in the Arctic backcountry. Um, it's one of the re- most remote places in the world, uh, one of arguably the most uncomfortable places in the world. So we faced, you know, a lot of crazy temperature swings and blizzards and encounters with wild animals. Um, and it was a way to really put myself into these, I guess I'd call them evolutionary discomforts that we as humans used to face every single day of our lives. And because of this, we developed these drives to always want to be comfortable. Right? Because when the world is uncomfortable, if I'm always seeking comfort, well, that helps me survive. Things like uh, I don't want to put physical effort into my days because that wastes energy, right? So that's why we don't like to exercise, all these, all these different things. And we now live in this really comfortable world. I mean, everything, our daily lives have become so comfortable, everything from you know, temperature control to our food system, to the fact that we've engineered effort out of our days, everything is easy. And so now we have these, these, uh, evolutionary mechanisms that no longer serve us because when I'm trying to always be comfortable in the world, that's comfortable, 
you know, it's, it can backfire on people. Yeah. You know, my wife and I, we moved to Panama and, and some people would say that that would definitely make them uncomfortable to just sell everything they own and move to a foreign country, uh, particularly one where they didn't actually speak the language. Um, and you know, my wife had only seen it for like four days when we made the decision to just sell our house and move here. Um, so we've done some things to make ourselves uncomfortable, but not anything like what you've experienced. So you've, you've done some pretty cool things uh, around this topic. And uh, I'm really glad to have this conversation to, to talk to you. Now, uh, you kind of got into the fact that because we kind of have this desire to seek comfort, uh, being comfortable is not always a really good thing for us. Can you, can you talk about the price of comfort? Yes. Well, I think what's interesting to think about is just how long humans lived in this uncomfortable environment. When you do the math, we've spent 99.96% of our time in these uncomfortable environments over 2.5 million years. The comforts that now most affect uh, my daily life, your daily life, they're all just a hundred years old. And by pushing ourselves into comfort all the time, we've lost a lot with our health, uh, our happiness, and just the feeling of being alive. So for example, with our health, it used to be that food, uh, we didn't really have comfort food. It wasn't ultra processed. Food was also harder to come by. We actually had to put effort into getting food. Now we live in this, you know, sea of ultra processed food, but we still have these internal drives to eat sugar, salt, fat, and eat too much of it. That used to keep us alive because it would help us onboard fat. And then when we had lean times, we would have something to draw from to stay alive. But now these drives are sort of causing obesity, uh, they tell us to not move as much as we would, as we should to burn it away. Uh, in terms of happiness, we humans tend to do well when we're challenged because it gives us a sense of accomplishment. And so as we evolved, we face challenges all the times. So these could be from, you know, something like a hunt, having to, um, having to migrate something like this. Nowadays, our challenges are often something like I have to give a PowerPoint presentation or, or, or whatever it is. Right. And there's just not as much reward in the challenges we face. And this is associated with decreasing levels of happiness, uh, increases in, in anxiety, because if you think about, you know, the most dangerous, treacherous thing you face is that your boss might give you a bad look because you messed up on a PowerPoint. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, the, <laughs> you're going to be anxious about a lot of things. Um, and in terms of just the feeling of being alive, I mean, we evolved in nature, for example. And like I said, we would do these challenging things in nature all the time. And that's really woven into our, to our DNA. You look at the work of, you know, someone like Joseph Campbell with the hero's journey. It's every culture from around the world has these stories about people doing interesting sort of epic things in nature and that being a real turning point for them internally. Well, we've lost a lot of that nowadays that we've made everything as safe and comfortable as possible. And I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to go up to Alaska at all. Uh, but what I am suggesting is that adding a little bit of discomfort back into your everyday life in a variety of forms can really move the dial on your health and happiness. And it's, and it's about meeting people where they're at so, you know, something that is comfortable or uncomfortable for one person may be totally comfortable for another. It's just slowly pushing your comfort zone. And by doing that, I think you can, you can find a lot out uh, about yourself and also move the dial on your health and happiness. Yeah. Uh, Donnie and Tom don't have enough space on their airplane to take us all up there. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, there, there is some value to being uncomfortable. Uh, you know, one that kind of comes to mind for me was if we were always comfortable, you know, for, we came up with inventions, we came up with fire, we came up with riding a horse, we came up with a lot of different things that we do. Uh, and there's just, and, and we call it progress, you know, so mm -hmm. in many cases, adding comfort has been progress. Um, and so there is a value uh, to to comfort or seeking comfort, but there's a point, like you say, I guess it, it be, we, we pass that line. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's really about balance. So if you look at all the data on how the world is doing, I mean, I think the world right now is better than it's ever been. 
people live longer, um, you know, child mortality rates are down, uh, hunger and starvation is down across the world. I mean, just every marker we're, we're doing better off, but we don't, we never offset that with, um, the discomforts we need to be healthy and happy. So if you ask, you know, if you ask the average person, they've done polls, do you think the world is getting better? Only 6% say that they think the world is getting better, which to me suggests we're missing something that makes us happy. Right. And I think it is that challenge, those elemental, uh, discomforts that we sort of evolved to face. Yeah. Well, I, I think we can all kind of agree that the, the best stories are the ones where there's a, a chance of failure, a chance of really screwing up, you know, that, that hold my beer moment. Uh, those are the best stories because there's that element of discomfort. There's that element of, in some cases, even danger. Um, can you kind of talk about the value of making yourself uncomfortable, uh, but then of course not dying? in the process. <laughs> well, I think, I think the nice thing too, about the, the modern comfortable world is, uh, it's a lot harder to die nowadays. Right. And so I think that, I think we have a lot of fears that we built as we evolved because those used to keep us safe. But nowadays, I mean, we, there's a lot of safety nets in life and we, you know, we even have technologies that, that can keep us safer. So for example, when I was in Alaska, I had this little GPS thing that kind of had this orange button you press if things go south and hopefully, you know, it alerts someone to come pick you up. Now, apparently it takes a handful of days for them to arrive, but it still would, you know, it's, yeah. I wouldn't have had that even 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And like I was mentioning the work of uh, Joseph Campbell, we know that when we challenge ourselves and put ourselves in position where there's a high degree of failure, that when we come out on the other side of that, we are better for it. It can help with a lot of uh, fears uh, fading away. So, for example, we get up to the uh, Arctic. We're in Kotzebue, Alaska is the town that we we left out of. And I'm standing on this runway. The wind is gusting. And the guy that I was up in the Arctic with, Donnie, he leans over to me. We're looking at these planes that we're going to take up there. And these planes are about the size of a pack of gum. I mean, two people fit in them. <laughs> And I hate flying, especially when it's in a plane like that. And Donnie leans over to me and goes, hey, you know, uh, I got the best pilots that I could. He's like, I'm not saying we're not going to crash and die. That, that is a high probability, but but I got the best pilot I could. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm terrified of getting in this plane, right? So I get in and we fly and the whole time I'm just like, oh man, this is, this is terrible. And then they drop us off in the Arctic and, and in the Arctic over 33 days, I face all these challenges that I've just never faced in my life, right? Having to cover this rough terrain with no safety net, you know, seeing wild, wild animals, uh, being exposed to, you know, hurricane force winds and blizzards and just all these things that are, are real challenges that have a high degree of risk. When that plane came back and picked me up 33 days later, I wasn't afraid to get into it, you know, because now I can put in perspective that, oh, well, this is actually not that, you know, there's a pilot here who's 50 years old. He's been doing this for, for 30 years. But when, when your challenges in your daily life and the things that you have to encounter really are very safe, I think it can throw off your perspective on, on what makes you afraid. And so by, putting yourself in positions of failure, you're going to learn something about fear and how a lot of our modern day fears are sort of unfounded and how those can hold us back from the things we really want to do in our lives. Yeah. You, you, you talked a lot in the story about, you know, at, well, I guess at one time you were, they, of course they had to shuttle you guys out there. So they just sort of left you out there at one spot where they, you know, so we'll, we'll, be, back, we'll be back and pick you up. You know, <laughs> it's like, how well do I know yeah. these guys? Uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, how much totally. uh, I already paid them the deposit. So, uh, you know, when am I going to make it? Um, and so you have those kind of things where, you know, you're kind of afraid to be alone, but I think the deeper thing for me was that you noticed at points in time during a hunt and, you know, having hunted when I was a kid, you're just sitting there looking at me as a pine forest in South Mississippi. Uh, but 99% of the time that you're on a hunt, there's absolutely nothing happening. And so you get really, really bored um, unless you've conditioned yourself to kind of 
go with it. And, and I think, you know, one of the core things you brought up in the book that I, was just kind of critical is we don't even know the value of actually being bored. We, we want something to entertain us all the time. It's like we get in the car, we turn on the radio uh, or a podcast, um, maybe this one, but we, we don't turn this stuff off and actually just sit there and stop and just, you know, so we're, yeah. we're literally hearing our heartbeat because we're that bored that we're like counting heartbeats and, you know, watching, watching a blade of grass and saying, you know, I, I think I saw it twitch, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Can you talk about the kind of being bored and, and why being bored is not actually a bad thing and why maybe we should actually lean into it? Yeah. So to your point about, you know, being in the woods in Mississippi and you're just kind of waiting hunting is a lot of waiting sometimes. And that's something that I was not used to. So we, in the Arctic, we would sit on these hills and we were hunting caribou. So we would have to wait for these caribou to, they're migrating. So you're trying to catch them as they're uh, moving into their, to their wintering grounds. So you'd sit on this hill and my cell phone does not work up there. There is not a lick of service within a hundred miles. Uh, so the thing is essentially useless. I didn't bring a book. I didn't bring magazines. I sure, I surely didn't have a TV. So what I'm left with is I would start to read labels on my energy bars. I would start to read the labels on the clothes I was wearing. And then when that gets boring, I start thinking of ideas and I start thinking of all these other things. And it was really interesting because nowadays, anytime we feel bored, we have this constant ability to kill our boredom, this discomfort of boredom. Anytime you feel a twinge of it, I mean, think if you ever look at a supermarket line, what is everyone doing? They're on their cell phones. Even 20 years ago, you would have to sort of stand there and be with yourself and with your thoughts. The brain essentially has two different ways of um, two different modes. And in the book, I simplify it and I call them focus mode and unfocused mode. Well, focus mode is any time that you are focusing on anything in the outside world. So your cell phone, as you're listening to this podcast, you're having to process information from the outside world. And this is like an active, it's almost like a workout for your brain. Uh, the other mode is unfocused mode. Now this is internal mind wandering. So this is the mode that I was in when I'm sitting on the Arctic tundra, trying to you know think of ideas and just having thoughts come into my brain. And this is essentially a rest state. It rests and restores your brain. Now we've totally tipped the balance. Modern life has tipped the balance. So we're always in this focus mode. And it's just like constantly trying to work and work and work our brains. We never experience boredom, this time where we have to go inward and be with that little bit of discomfort and then send our minds down different ways of mind wandering, which restores our thinking and creativity. So the benefits of boredom, you know, research shows that it, it revives your brain. Um, not being bored enough is actually associated with high rates of anxiety because it's, you know, you're just really taxing your outward system. It's associated with more creativity. And I think part of that is because nowadays when we're bored, if we just pull out Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is, we're focusing on the exact same type of media that everyone else is. And we're not having time to come up with ideas in our own mind that are our own ideas. Experience boredom is associated with more focus and productivity. But I think one thing that is, that is key is you hear so much today, you need to be, you know, get on your phone less, get on your phone less. If you look at the data, people actually spend a lot more time engaging with all different kinds of media. Like people watch twice as much TV as they do have screen time on their phones. We've inserted essentially 11 hours, I think is the average, 11 hours and six minutes to be exact, uh, digital media in our day. That's how much time we're spending engaging with digital media. So I tend to think about it instead of less phone, I tend to think about it more as more boredom. How can I just find these spaces where I can just have no outside stimulation and allow my mind to go inward and sort of revive and reset? And if we can do that, even though it's uncomfortable, I mean, it's much easier to just go on Instagram. Uh, I think we're going to move the dial a lot on our mental health. And you'll find often with, with a lot of these discomforts that I'm talking about, there's an initial period where you're like, man, this really sucks. I don't like this. <laughs> this is uncomfortable. <laughs> But after a certain time, once you sort of get through that rough patch, you're like, oh, I see what I'm doing this for. And you start to really see those rewards. I mean, nothing in life 
whether it be something very simple, like not being, not defaulting to TV or your computer or your phone, uh, or whether it be like a massive, massive workout or challenge is ever going to be easy. So just accepting that there's going to be that hard part and going through it anyways, uh, you'll see that benefit. Yeah. I was, um, I, I took, I took what you put to heart and I, I was going for my, my normal little walk around here on the Island. I, I like walking out by the beach and I was on my way out there. Normally what I would do is I'd put on a podcast or an audio book mm-hmm. and then I'd have my run keeper that would, you know, tell me my, my, my splits every five minutes, you know, that's chiming in and telling me what my splits are. And I, I just got to think of myself, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to keep my run keeper on but I'm going to, I'm going to turn the volume all the way down. So I don't hear my splits and I put the pocket, put the phone in my pocket and I'm not going to pay any attention until I get to a certain point. And then I'll just want to check my time to make sure that I can get back in time for what I got to get done for the day. And yeah, it's like it, it, at first you're going and you're kind of like, just, you start becoming hyper sensitive to everything around. You start paying a lot more attention and so on this walk beyond just, you know, having a good walk and enjoying, uh, some warm weather, you know, so <laughs> heat shock proteins. Um, <laughs> I, um, I noticed a lot more, you know, I just, I noticed like a, a, a line of leaf cutter ants walking down the side of the road with me, you know, I was about to step on them and I was like, Oh, leaf cutters. And I'm just, so I'm walking along and I'm seeing leaves and I'm like, okay, you know, just, it was a long, long trail. Like they, maybe about a quarter of a mile, these guys were traveling. And, uh, so it was just kind of one of those things where I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm opening up. I'm, I'm noticing more about the world around me. I'm noticing more about myself, like how, how my legs feel, how my feet feel, uh, you know, just, just the whole bit of it. And it just gives you a lot more time to actually get in, get in your head and, and think versus yeah. a lot of times we try to turn that inner voice off. And I think a lot of times it's because we just don't like that guy. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you're like, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to get to know that person. And the only way I can do that is to be alone with them. Yeah. I love that story. That's so great. Because the thing about those leaf cutter ants is you're going to remember them for next year, five years, 10 years. Oh, I was here and I saw that row of leaf cutter ants doing their thing, moving through the world that's going to create an impression in your mind. And isn't, I mean, this is the stuff that we're really going to remember. I mean, I think that the media is obviously amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. It's so fun to see what people are doing on Instagram and getting cool ideas and listening to podcasts like yours. I mean, there's a ton of value in this stuff. There really is, but I think it's figuring out the balance, right? If, if our D we are programmed to default to always being stimulated, never wanting to be bored and we just have the easiest out for that. So I think we need to reinsert uh, boredom into our lives because when we were evolving, we had long periods of boredom and these help these help us be productive and, you know, effective humans. And we've sort of removed them and there's been some serious downsides, but I, but I love what you say about that. And, and I think that, you know, you're smart because you're, you're doing it in a way where you can still use the technology. You're just figuring out, well, how do I use this smarter? So I can sort of balance it. I can get benefits of boredom, but also this super cool technology that we have access to, you know, the answer isn't like, we don't all want to live like Luddites. That's, that sounds terrible to me, (laughs) but it's uh, it's the balance. Yeah. And, and, and the worst part of it was I was sitting there saying, I, sh- I should pull my phone out and take a picture of these ants. And I'm like, no, yeah. no, that whole purpose was to, to not interact with my phone this whole two hours. And, uh, yeah. And those ants are yours. I can post, you know, post, post, post it on Facebook. Everybody like, that's so cool. I get those likes and, and retweets, yeah. and, you know, all that stuff. And I was like, no, no, that, that breaks the whole purpose of why I'm here. I'm not here to, to do a documentary on leaf cutter ants. I'm here to yeah. enjoy, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy some time with myself. This episode of the 40 plus fitness podcast is sponsored by naked nutrition. What does getting naked mean for supplements? It means no unnecessary additives. It means premium sourced ingredients without fillers, so you don't need to compromise on your diet or your goals. That's what Naked Nutrition offers. Back in 2014, a former college athlete didn't understand why protein powders and other supplements had so many unnatural ingredients. If they're supposed to be health supplements, why can't you understand the ingredient list? Naked Nutrition was started with five single ingredient supplements, including the best-selling Naked Way, 
which has only one ingredient, whey protein from grass-fed California cows, and the best-selling Naked Pea, a vegan protein made from one ingredient, raw yellow peas grown in the U.S. and Canada. The company has grown to offer over 40 products, but the vision of sourcing the best ingredients, using as few of them as possible, and being transparent so you know exactly what's going into your body is the same today as when the company was founded. Whether you're working towards losing weight, having more energy, or improving your endurance to become a better runner, what you put in your body directly impacts how you feel and the results you get. Naked Nutrition is committed to shortening the steps between their farms and you. Get naked. Visit Naked Nutrition today. It's nutrition with nothing to hide. Use the discount code 40PLUS and get 10% off your first order. NakedNutrition.com Um, I think another thing that you got into, uh, that was really important, uh, and it, it, it was, it was thrust upon you because 33 days. And I think people would say, okay, sure. There's, there's not a McDonald's up there or even a Tim Hortons or anything for you to just say, okay, you know, let's pop in and have some breakfast and then we'll go hunting or after the breakfast, we'll, you know, go by the room, take a shower, get ourselves cleaned up and have a really nice dinner tonight. You know, I hope they have that wine we had last time. Um, that's not life. You had to carry all your food with you short of what you actually were going to then be able to get on a hunt. Mm -hmm. And so you started doing the math and realizing, okay, I'm not going to be able to carry enough calories yeah. for, for the whole trip. And that meant at some point along the way, and I don't think it was that far into the trip, you started experiencing hunger and it's not the, the hunger of, you know, gee, I wish I had some Doritos. It was like <laughs> yeah. real, real innate hunger. Could you, could you talk about a, yeah. being hungry and, and, and why that is important? Sure. So when we did, when you run the numbers, we, you know, we're carrying these heavy 80, 90 pound bat, uh, packs all over the place. The landscape is, you know, hilly and treacherous and we're probably burning, I don't know, somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 calories a day. But if we were to bring enough food to fuel that, I mean, our packs would be, it wouldn't all fit in the pack. All we would have is just a bunch of food. So we had to pare down and figure out, okay, how much is enough reasonably, um, to stay alive more or less. And that was, we could figure it would be about 2000 calories. So that's what we pack. So we're every day we're digging ourselves into this hole and there's just never enough food. And what happens over time is fascinating is you start to feel hungry and your mind starts to really focus on food. And these are these evolutionary mechanisms that we've developed um, to force us to find food, right? That really compels you to find food, but feeling that hunger was fascinating because you know, my average day, I eat for reasons that often have nothing to do with hunger. It could be that, oh, I woke up and it's breakfast. I got to eat breakfast. So essentially the clock is telling me that I should eat, right? Or maybe I get stressed and I'm like, oh man, I hate that email I just received. The hand goes into the M&Ms and I shove them into my face, you know? A lot of the data shows that that as much as 80% of the times we eat aren't driven by actual physiological hunger. It's just because, like I said, it's a clock or stress or, or whatever. So re-engaging with, with actual core deep hunger was fascinating. Cause I'm like, man, I haven't ever felt this before. And I learned a lot of interesting things about hunger. And one of them too, is that, you know, over time, it's not, it's not going to kill you. You know, out there, it's like I lost 10 pounds over the 33 months or whatever it was. Um, but I realized re-engaging with hunger is actually a good thing because if you can figure out when I'm, this is true hunger versus this is just me wanting food, that can really move the dial. Because I mean, right now it's, I think in the US, it's 72% of Americans are overweight or obese. I mean, we're clearly suffering from a crisis where we're just eating too much. And that suggests to me that probably, you know, re-engaging with hunger and learning about when do I actually need food versus when do I want food can be really important in moving the dial on our health through weight loss. So I would say that it just, when I came back from the Arctic, I realized that a lot of times 
like I said, it's just a, I just want food or it's a clock that tells me I want food and feeling that hunger uh, can lead a lot of internal uh, physical change. So I think, you know, embracing hunger is important. And, you know, I, pe- I know people get really, um, I guess I would say ideological. I don't know if that's the right word about certain diets and and all that. Um, my own opinion is that if you look at all the research, it um, weight loss is primarily driven by calorie balance. And so just figuring out a way that you can, you can eat that uh, will control your hunger, but you're not eating too much is important. And so in, in the book, I talk about uh, ways of, of certain foods that research suggests tend to help us fight hunger, but also control our calories. So these tend to be foods that we've often heard are not good for us, like potatoes or, or different forms of carbs that are unprocessed that actually are good because they can help us control hunger and keep our calories low. It's this concept called calorie density, which is kind of a sciencey way of saying they fill you up without having as many calories as other foods. Yeah. And I think one of the things that kind of came out of it is it, it is, as soon as you killed the caribou, you, you ate like a king and it was one of the best meals you'd had in a long life. And you even started liking the, uh, the instant meals, you know, just the, the reconstituted meals. You're like, it's fine. I, I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, still, it's, it's still delicious. Cause it's, mm-hmm. I'm that hungry that you were truly tasting your food. Yeah. And, huh. and the, go ahead. I was going to say hunger is the best sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, uh, veg- if you are a person who thinks that vegetables are disgusting, that's probably because you're only eating things like Doritos that are engineered to be just like so amazing. And if you take yourself away from that for a little while, you realize that vegetables have a lot of amazing nuances that are, that are great, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's what we miss is that, you know, like you said, we're eating all the time. We're eating things that are designed to make us eat more. Um, mm-hmm. We're not giving our body an opportunity to actually understand the hunger signals. And then when food is available, which here it's always available, it's mm-hmm. everywhere. We tend to overeat. Um, and, you know, they'll, the dietitians they'll warn you, don't let yourself get hungry. And then the food companies will take advantage of it and someone will be upset and not feeling good because they're hangry and they're going to tell them, oh, you need a Snickers. And mm-hmm. so that's the solution to your, your hunger problem. And it's not even true hunger because you haven't gone without food long enough or you've had enough food to not need that food. But we, we haven't turned on those hunger signals. And obviously you being out there for 33 days, you turned on some hunger signals. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I think in a lot of ways, food has become a, a widget for a way to solve for other problems. You know, I'm stressed. I'm going to eat. Um, I'm bored. I'll eat. I know I just said boredom's good. So don't just eat if you're bored. <laughs> Find other <laughs> ways to go. <laughs> but yeah, you, you know, we develop these evolutionary mechanisms that favor us to eat uh, foods that are as calorie dense as possible. Now in nature, as we evolved, you really don't find that many foods that are really calorie dense. Uh, I would think honey is the most calorie dense of the foods you find. Uh, But now we have foods that are engineered to be these, you know, globs of sugar, salt, and fat that are amazing. And I'm not saying don't ever eat those, but it's, they need to be balanced, you know, and we need to, to, uh, engage with hunger a little bit, learn that hunger, Mm -hmm. hunger is actually a good thing. Like you said, we've, we've been told that, Oh, don't ever feel hungry. That's, you know, you're hangry or whatever it is. No, it's a good thing. Yeah. And I, and I think if you had to take several bee stings, uh, to get that, uh, high calorie dense food, um, instead of buying it in, like you said, a cute little jar, uh, looks shaped like a little bear, uh, we probably wouldn't do it as much, but yeah. So it's okay to be hungry, you know, like you said, I mean, we, we use the term starving, but that's not the right word. And even in your situation, you, you knew you'd, you'd brought enough food to probably not starve, Yeah. Uh, but it also heightened your, your desire to, to do something. So it, yeah. it, it kept you motivated and driving rather than just saying, I'm going to go cuddle in the teepee for the next uh, 20 days and hope I don't burn any more calories. Yeah. Um, it got you moving. It got you guys doing more so that you could get that, that kill could get some food. Um, and that's, that's actually a good thing. If you can find the ways to going to drive you to a better behavior, uh, you've got to be hungry for it. And that's whether that's eating the right foods or, or getting your food. Um, you've got to think of it in those terms. Yeah. 
Yep, exactly. Michael, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Well, we just talked about one of them. I think re-engaging with hunger can be important. I mean, I think that our food, how we eat today is one of the number one drivers of our uh, health problems because people just eat too much and, and they don't move enough. And I think, uh, figuring out, uh, ways to lose weight. If you're currently overweight is going to be the number one thing you can do from your health, assuming you're not smoking or something like that. Um, you look at the data and it's pretty overwhelming and, you know, yes, there are people who are overweight, who are metabolically healthy and that's, that's great. Uh, but I do think if you look at most people, most of the time, um, some, some ground can be gained by, um, losing a little weight. And I think that food is one of the best ways to do that. Uh, number two, I would say is that, uh, I would love it if people would start thinking about how can I do epic things in my life? So for me, it was this 33 days in the Alaskan backcountry. right? I go out there, I experience all these different forms of discomfort. I'm in nature for a long time. Um, I experienced some hunger. I have to put physical effort in. And I think that doing that can really move the dial on our health and happiness, but more importantly, it can change us internally. So as I mentioned before, it's like when I was on that runway, first about to head up there, I mean, I'm this like overstressed guy. I'm afraid to get on this plane. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. We're going in that little thing. And at the end of that, sort of going on this journey of having to face all these discomforts, I learned a lot about myself and it really transformed me. And I would say moved the dial on a lot of things in my life, just stress levels. You know, when I got back, I could see, oh, like waiting in a line is not a big deal, you know, because I had had all these true dangers and things happen to me. And so I think for, for people, it's, you know, what is something that you can do get outside, exercise, some way to challenge yourself that will help put all these things in perspective and also get you out and moving. So maybe that's, oh, there's this mountain near my house that I've never climbed and I've never climbed a mountain before. You know, it could be like a five, 10 mile hike, but if you've never done that before, I think picking something that has sort of a chance of failure, chance you may not make it, where you put yourself in a position where you have to dig deep physically and psychologically and emotionally When you complete that, it's like a massive, massive confidence boost and just moves your life uh, in the right direction. And let's see, number three, let me think on this. Oh, I would say to think about your death each day, which I realize that seems somewhat morbid when people hear it. Um, (laughs) But, you know, as we evolve, we really engage with the life cycle. So I know for me, I went up to uh, Alaska, we're hunting and we look for these caribou for like 15 days and we finally get a chance where we, you know, I'm going to potentially be able to uh, kill one. And uh, I have the gun and I am super reticent about hunting this whole time. Cause I'm coming from this world where, you know, our meat is uh, presented to us totally perfectly manicured. Death is death. And the life cycle is totally removed from our lives. Everything from our funeral system to how we react when someone dies, you know, we're told to keep our mind off it. So we're, you know, crawling out there and I get in this position where the animal is, is close enough within shooting distance. And I'm kind of hesitating, you know, cause I'm like, oh man, this is a beautiful creature. I don't ever engage with this kind of stuff. And the guy I'm with Don, he says, you know, look, if you don't want to shoot, you don't got to shoot, but if you're going to shoot, you got to do it now. And I pull the trigger and the animal goes down and my initial reaction is, oh my God, what have I done? You know, it was this just sinking feeling. We go out and, you know, see the animal it's down and I just feel terrible. It's like, what, what has happened here? What have I done? And um, then we began to break the animal down, to field dress it, to bring it back to camp. And my mind started to shift because you start to see that this living creature is going to provide life for me, for my family to give us, you know, food. And that death is ultimately part of the life cycle. Like it is a, it is a clear realization for me that happened that, Oh, you know, death is part of the life cycle. And I started to research this when I, when I got back from Alaska and I ended up going to 
doing some traveling around this and a lot of research. And when you look at the research, people who think about death, which is something, you know, we're not, we're told, Oh, don't do that. Cause that's morbid. And that'll make you sad. When you look at the research, it actually makes people happier because it cuts out a lot, cuts a lot of the fat out of your life, right? If you just think once a day, Oh, I'm going to die at one point, you're not going to get hung up on these stupid little things that we tend to get so anxious and hung up on every day, right? You start to see people start to focus on the things that are really going to make them truly happier. So I think the three things that I just named are kind of like this holistic system that can help with your mind, body, and spirit more or less. And I agree with all of those. Thank you. If someone wanted to learn more about you, learn more about the book, The Comfort Crisis, where would you like for me to send them? Uh, you can go to eastermichael.com. Uh, if you want to learn more about me, I'm active on Instagram as well, Michael underscore Easter. I try not to be too active on it because of that boredom <laughs> thing. But uh, yeah, those are probably the two best ways to find it. And the book's available anywhere you get books. So Okay. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 485, and I'll be sure to have links there. Michael, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, thank you for having me. Raz, welcome back. Hey, Alan. What a wonderful story from Michael on his adventure in the Arctic. My gosh, talk about discomfort. <laughs> Whew, he had a lot of it. He did. You know, well, you know, one, first, we probably didn't dive into it enough in the conversation, but he was terrified to get on that little plane. He was a little bit, these were little <laughs> bitty planes where he yeah. really kind of felt like he was straddling the, the uh, pilot while he was sitting in that airplane with his equipment Gosh. and the plane he was on couldn't go and land where they needed to. So they dropped the two of them off out in the middle of freaking nowhere, Alaska, <laughs> and then take off to nowhere, Alaska to basically shuttle these guys. And then they leave him out there. And I'm like, no, no, I would have wow. been the second person on the plane. So I'm not <laughs> sitting out in the middle of nowhere by myself alone. Um, alone. Um, that, that would have kind of got me. I mean, and I, I've had some moments in my life where I was outside my comfort zone, did some things I, you know, look back on and say, well, some people would call that fo foolish, but you know, damn, it makes a good story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like walking down into the basement with uh, four Koreans, two of them in front of me, two of them behind me, and I'm there to catch them committing fraud, uh, oh. thinking I might not actually come out of this basement again. Um, wow. So you have those stories. And that's one of the cool things about this book is not just that Michael's sharing his stories, but he's sharing lessons about how being outside your comfort zone makes for a better life across the board, whether you're looking at your career, your relationships, your health, your fitness, mm -hmm. everything great happens outside the comfort zone. Oh my gosh. It's so true. He even drew a line right towards um, adding discomfort to your life can give you health and happiness, happiness through yeah. discomfort. It's kind of a mind blowing concept right there. Well, you've experienced it. So oh, yeah. let's, let's talk about your first marathon. How painful <laughs> was, yeah. was that run? I mean, you know, if you're yep. at the end, you're at that end, you're at, you're at that, that 22 mile mark mm -hmm. and you're watching other runners around you quit. You're seeing mm -hmm. medical attention being given to people on the side of the road mm -hmm. and you're seeing also seeing people cheering you on, mm -hmm. but it's uncomfortable it and, is. and there would be no shame in quitting. Right. Well, I'll, I'll even take it a step back and, and say my first 5k was out of my comfort zone. So it was my first 10 K my first half marathon was in a Florida hurricane situation. <laughs> and my, my first marathon was just as difficult. Um, although it was at the happiest place on earth with this, which is Disney. My first full marathon was Disney, but, but yeah, every single step of the way in my running um, career has been taking that one step outside what I know I could do, what I'm comfortable doing doing and seeing what can I accomplish? What can I do? 
Um, and, and how crazy is that? And, and then every time I accomplish something, I'm, um, I'm stronger for it and more confident and, and more confident when I want to try something new, like my first 50 mile (laughs) that I'll be doing this summer. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I, um, embrace running and, and just share it with the world so much because it can give you so much back. It's hard and it's scary, but it gives you so much back. Yeah. And, and we've become too comfortable to mm-hmm. the point of, you know, we, we go for the convenience. And so beyond just comfort, there's convenience mm-hmm. and you'll hear the word comfort foods and comfort foods. Yeah. Typically are high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar, high in everything, you know, and all put together and, and they make you feel good. They give you the, the feel good, comfortable feeling, um, you know, chicken and dumplings, um, is, is one that just comes to mind for me is they call that a comfort food. And, sure. you know, it's like, okay, cool. Occasionally having a little bit of comfort, not a problem. Having it every single day, having the convenience of driving up and ordering a donut and a coffee on your way to work and then getting something from the vending machine because you're starving two hours later. And, mm-hmm. and for the record, you're not actually starving. <laughs> no. You're just having a little bit of a sugar rush and then a yeah. sugar crash. And that's what you're having. And it's not, you're not starving. And so I think the recognition that if once we start seeing the comfort that's in our lives Mm -hmm. and we start challenging that and saying, is that comfort serving me or is that comfort holding me back? Mm, We're almost blind to it because we're in it and it's just so easy. And this is just the way it is. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, the more you sit there and say, is this the right comfort? for me to be in. So, you know, granted, I want my room cool at night so I can sleep better. So we have an air conditioner in our bedroom. Mm -hmm. We don't have an air conditioner in the living space of the bed and breakfast. And so on a hot day, like today is probably somewhere in the nineties and it's really, really humid. And so sitting in the living room with the fans going, um, is right on that edge of comfortable. I'm, you know, I'm sitting in my living room, sweating, (laughs) <laughs> most, most people don't want to be sweating when they're sitting in their living room. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to have the AC on. They're going to be very comfortable. Uh, they're not going to want to walk outside. To, I'll check the mail on my way to work tomorrow. You know, that kind of comfort. Mm-hmm. And it's like, get out, you know, move around. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Um, so you sweat a little. Mm-hmm. Take a shower before bed. Right. Um, so look at the comfort that's in your life and just say, is this, is this serving me? Is this making me a better person? And there are times when comfort will there, you know, I sleep better when I, the room temperature is cooler. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we didn't have an air conditioner in there, I wouldn't sleep as well. Um, we have a, we have an air fryer and the air fryer can do, you know, the toasting, the grilling, I mean, the baking, the, the air frying, the, the broiling. And so it's a very convenient, um, comfortable device to have sitting on our counter. Mm-hmm. I don't use it to make pop tarts. <laughs> um, <laughs> I use it to bake chicken or broil a uh, steak or, you know, do those types of things. Um, so don't get, don't think that all comfort is, is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, it's just a function of saying, am I using comfort where, where it matters? Sure. You know, a good massage uh, is comfortable. Having a comfortable bed is comfortable. Um, those are important things for your wellness, but, you know, having complete access to all this food, calling Uber eats every night because you can, um, never, never getting hot, never getting cold. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not how we were intended to, to be. We were intended to be a little uncomfortable most of the time uh, and really uncomfortable some of the time. Mm Mm-hmm. I think we've lost a little of that um, satisfaction of doing certain things for ourselves. Like you mentioned, cooking a proper meal from scratch versus ordering Uber Eats or something. You know, if you can gather fresh ingredients and make this wonderful meal for your family all on your own, just think of the pride that you'll have. Not even to mention the taste will be so much better than running out to a restaurant and getting some fat laden 
food, but um, you've got pride in your food. You've got a tasty meal, plus it contributes to your health instead of taking away from your health. So it's just these little things. Like if you can allow yourself that extra time to take the time to get the good food, to, to prepare a nice meal, to take a walk to the store instead of a drive to the store. If you can just take a minute to reassess and maybe give you that little extra time to do these things by hand and from scratch, just think of the satisfaction you'll have having accomplished all that. Yeah. And, and I would even take it a step further and say, okay, so, so imagine you do this. Um, you set up a, a plant bed in your backyard or a patio garden. Mm-hmm. And you plant some plants. Uh, if you have the space and you, in your city allows it, um, you you raise some chickens. Oh man, yeah, you know that and, would be fun. <laughs> and and maybe you go ahead in a co-op and you you know you can share in a buying a cow. You know sometimes they'll do oh, that, yeah. like a local farm, and you all go in together and say, okay, so I'm buying half a cow and they're buying. So we all contribute our money, mm-hmm. and we buy the calves, and we've paid for the food. And we have a responsibility to go out there on our days and feed the cow sure. and take care of it. It's a co-op. We're all involved. We're all working together. Or we're doing it at home, raising the chickens, getting the eggs, growing the vegetables. So you're mm-hmm. growing spinach and you've got the eggs. And so you 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 know you make yourself a, an omelet with the spinach and the eggs that mm-hmm. you grew. That you know you took the little chick and you took the little seedling and you made yourself that meal from not just scratch but from actual dirt you know (laughs) how how amazing and how satisfying that is i I, that would be wonderful and it's not even just you i mean if you this was a part of your family this was like a Mm -hmm. how we spend a saturday you know we spend the saturday my my brother they raise chickens and so his little girls they know how to care for the chickens and uh, they named all theirs, so they have no intention of eating the chickens, but they mm-hmm. eat the eggs. That's awesome. Um, yeah, except for the the fox incident, but uh, oh, we don't want to talk. We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just kind of one of those things of this is a learning experience for them to be able mm-hmm. to see where their food is coming from and recognize, okay, this is you know, this is where all this stuff comes from, and it's not you don't just go to the grocery store to buy stuff. Oh yeah. You, know, you, you you can you can do it yourself and it's uncomfortable, it's extra work. It means, you know, a weekend where you're building something, you're putting, you know, dealing with soil and all the other stuff, you're learning new things, you're teaching mm-hmm. kids new things, uh, but you're spending that quality time together and that's again oh, yeah. the the value of discomfort can be the value of learning. It's the value of relationship, it's the value of better quality of pretty much everything in your life. And that, so that's what this book was really about. He's a fabulous writer. It's a re- really interesting story. Um, if you're anti-hunting, um, well, there is hunting in the book, but I want you to recognize the the concepts of it. He does talk about that because he had never hunted before. And so he's not oh. pro-hunting even now, uh, but he wanted to, the experience and he went out and did it. Wow. Um, he doesn't know if he'll do it again. Mm-hmm. but it was just an experience that he wanted to have. All of the meat from that animal was consumed by him and his family. So he did mm-hmm. bring that meat home. Um, so it was not just an unethical trophy kill that you see the pictures and you know, that this was, sure. was these were legitimate hunts and for food wow. and controlled by the wildlife stuff, but just recognize that. Yeah. He made himself very, very uncomfortable for 33 days, experienced yeah. a lot of things, has a lot of stories to tell, and he's a really good storyteller. So it's it's a really good book from that perspective too. Wonderful. It sounds wonderful. What an adventure he had for sure. All right, Rachel. Well, I will talk to you next week. All right. Take care. You too. Thanks. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss working out with your partner. Until then, have a happy and healthy day.